Greetings fellow members of the Esoteric Order of Gamers. I'm going to do something a little different today. It's an interview with Universal Head, which is me, of course, also known as Peter. Well, Peter, also known as Universal Head, anyway. Um, and my lovely partner Carol here is going to do a little interview with me about a gaming object from my past. So uh, let's see what happens. Yes, and this gaming object looks like it's from the dim dark past. It is the dim dark past. It's 1978. And we're going to uh, illustrate this with this object in front of me, which some of you might not recognise. It's called a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> now, the typewriter was, of course, the <laughs> method of uh, typing things on paper, getting type on paper before uh, computers came along. This one comes from 1964. Now I'm horrified to say that is one year older than me. So when I was a child, I typed on this typewriter. And in fact, this uh, just appeared again. And the reason is, and the reason I'm getting to it, this is all coming together. But the reason um, we've got this typewriter here is because um, it was Carol's, uh, it's Carol's birthday coming up. And we saw my mother yesterday, and she gave Carol this typewriter as I a have present. Lots of lovely typewriters. Yes, Carol has lots of typewriters. She collects them, and um, she gave her this one. And of course, as soon as I saw the box, I went, "I know that typewriter because I grew up with it." Um, 1964. It was in the house, and I, not only did I grow up with it, but I immediately remembered that I had done some old Dungeons and Dragons stuff on this particular typewriter. And here it is. I just found it. So we thought we'd talk about some of this stuff because it's all kind of weird, it's very nostalgic and it's kind of ancient history for people who, you know, weren't even around when typewriters were around. I'm going to hand you the box cover now and it would be great if you could show everyone what that looks like and then I've got some questions for you. Here it is folks, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, this is the John Holmes version of Basic D&D. You can see it's very, very well worn. Um, this is from 1978, which is the year I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, it's the year I discovered uh, games in general. And the first thing I played was a game called Empire of the Petal Throne. Um, and then we quickly got on to Dungeons and Dragons. And you can see, look, Peter Gifford, I wrote up in the top. This is my basic set. And wow, it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? So can you remember when you got it? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> a significant moment in your I'm childhood. I'm pretty sure I bought it myself. There was a store called Models and Figurines mm -hmm. uh, in Sydney and it was the only game store that I knew of. Now I don't remember whether I got this as a present or whether I bought it myself from that store but um, I got this uh, very very early on and then quickly after this the hardcover advanced D&D book started coming out. So. We played with this for a little while, but it's only designed for levels one to three, so there's not a whole lot of stuff uh, in the basic set. Um, after that, the uh, the first book that came out was the Monster Manual for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and then the Player's Handbook, and then I remember an interminable wait for the Dungeon Master's Guide, because I was always the Dungeon Master, and we had to wait a while for the hardcover to come out. Can you remember who you used to play it with? Yes, I played it with uh, a bunch of guys who were still friends of mine, um, which is pretty amazing because quite a few years passed under the bridge since then. And um, we played um, Dungeons and Dragons. I went to school with some of them. Um, some of them went to another school. I met them later. We used to play. Um, and after a while, playing D we didn't play D&D a whole lot. Um, and also, I was thinking of this the other day because I was watching Stranger Things 3, of course, the third season of Stranger Things. It's Stranger Things that keep bringing up D&D. &D, mm -hmm. And it's kind of this, this era of D&D. &D. Actually, that's set in 85, the nearest one, so that's a bit on from this. But, um, yeah, they're playing D&D. &D. Um, and, uh, yeah, but uh, after that we went on to play Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which was another a system. And uh, we were playing that for, you know ages, up until 10 years ago, I think. So you mentioned 1985, and I wasn't a member of the gaming echelon. I was too busy reading in the library. But I'm wondering, is it around that 1985 time frame or earlier that Dungeons & Dragons was mentioned on that famous episode of 60 Minutes that I can remember? 
Oh, yeah. No, I think that was earlier than 85. Was it? Hmm. I mean, 85, I left school and everything, so I'm pretty sure I was still in school, so it would have been more like 82 or something like that. Um, 60 Minutes is in, uh, in America, as you know, but in Australia there was a version as well. And they did a story during the height of um, the sort of scare about Dungeons and Dragons where they thought that, you know, the devil worshipping was involved and, and conservative Christian groups were all up in arms about it. And they did this incredibly over-the-top, uh, dramatised kind of episode where they, they'd flash into pictures of the cover of the advanced dungeon, you know, <laughs> the dungeon master's guy with demons on it and, you know, dramatic music and camera angles and the whole bit. There are dwarfs, knights and thieves, gods and devils, magic and spells. So I was very incensed by this episode. I was about 16 or something and very upset about the whole thing. So I wrote them a long and detailed uh, letter describing how good D&D was for growing minds and how um, it had been responsible for me getting into graphic design or being interested in graphic design as a young kid and um, all its wonderful advantages. And they wrote back and just sort of basically said, shut up, kid. So with the benefit of hindsight, do you think it was good for growing minds or did it in oh. fact have a deleterious effect upon your growth oh. as an adult? There is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that d d is fantastic for growing minds. Mm. Role-playing games are great for growing minds. It develops your imagination. It gets you with a bunch of people, so it's a social activity. You're not sort of stuck in front of a computer screen or something like that. Um, it, it teaches you all kinds of skills. I mean, there's uh, an artistic element to it, there's an imaginative element to it, um, there's uh, developing empathy for different types of characters and doing things. That, uh, it's just endless advantages. I think it's great. It was especially good back then because it was just so revolutionary and so different to anything anyone was doing back then. It's very hard to get across the feeling of what it was like when D&D was new and it was so different. I mean, you would describe what you were doing and people would just go, what the hell? What What are you doing? I don't get it. I mean, you know, it's in your imagination. Huh? It's, it's really weird. I have to ask this question. Yeah. Did your playing of D&D &D at any point in time involve devil worship? <laughs> no, well, there was that time we summoned de No, there's no devil worship at that time. Well, I don't know. I've pulled this out of the box, and it it, it seems to be counter to what you've said. I'd oh, like you oh, to what? I'd like you to read the word on the bottom left hand oh. side. What's that word? Uh, it's the word demoniac. <laughs> right, and on, on the left hand side, uh, diabolic. Right, <laughs> just to confirm. But there is saintly and um, beatific on the on the top. This is, of course, the character alignment uh, graph from. Uh, in, Appendix 3 of the basic Dungeons and Dragons set, which has, you know, lawful good, character good, whatever. So that's the alignments, which are the things. And no one ever actually paid any attention to alignments that I, that in any of the games we played. We didn't really bother with it too much. No one was ever lawful good or anything like that. Most of the time we were chaotic neutral or chaotic evil, which meant you could do whatever the hell you wanted. But yeah, no, no devil worship. Right, okay. Uh, on that note, can I get you to just read uh, the first... Four lines of this poem that seems to be to have oh. been written at the time. Uh, the poem or the top bit of the stuff? Well, you can, you can start oh, okay. at the top if you'd like. It says, A Kekarak congratulates you on your powers of observation, so make it this whatever you wish, for you will be mine in the end, no matter what. Mm. And then, Go back to the tormentor or through the arch in the second great hall you'll discover. Shun green if you can, but night's good colour is for those of great valour. This is pretty bad poetry, really, isn't it? If shades of red stand for blood, the wise will not need sacrifice aught but a loop of magic metal, magical metal you're well along your march. Now, I notice I put Y-O-U apostrophe R-E for your march, so you can show, see how young it was. Now, let me tell you what this is. This is um, an important part from the uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons module S1, Tomb of Horrors. Wow, Tomb now, of Horrors. Tomb of Horrors, and this is the... Um, uh, thing that's written when you go into the tomb which is supposed to warn you of all the horrors involved. Mm -hmm. It was a death trap dungeon, really easy to die horribly in it. Now the other thing about this uh, module is that it was the first adventure module that TSR ever created. TSR standing for? Oh, Tactical Studies Rules, who published Dungeons and Dragons. Um, 
It was the first one. It was the first thing that I ever bought uh, for D and D after this basic set. It was the first module I ever bought. I've still got it with me now. Um, it's really good. And as a sort of contemporary note, uh, there was the recent film, which was um, Ready Player One. Now, not in the film, but in the book, which I listened to the audio version of and was pretty bad, really, but, you know, I listened to it. There's a whole section in the book Ready Player One, which is about this module S1 Tomb of Horrors, and he actually, in a virtual world, goes into a virtual version of the Tomb of Horrors. So, there you go, bringing it around. Right, okay. Uh, just a very quick question here. I'm going to take you back in time. There's the Wandering Monster Table, which I'm referring to at this point. Yep. It's got one level below ground, two levels below ground, and three levels below ground. I'm particularly interested in which of these were a preference for you. The Gelatinous Cube, ah. the Carrion Crawler, or the Ochre Jelly? Oh, that's tough, but I think Gelatinous Cube has definitely got the... Um Got the prize for being um, most important and right. uh, uh, the special place in my heart. Gelatinous cube was like this huge gelatinous cube. It was a big cube that was <laughs> gelatinous, and it no God, this what a great idea for a monster. And it moves through dungeon corridors, filling the entire passageway, right? And you're walking along. Your party is walking along the passageway in the dungeon, and this huge gelatinous thing which fills the, fills the whole passageway starts moving towards you uh -huh. and it swallows up people so you can see in this sort of translucent cube there are like skeletons and swords and bits of old adventuring parties stuck in this cube and it's moving towards you and it swallows you up it's horrible well do i have a treat for you guess what's for dinner tonight oh gelatinous cube yum all right so this is this is quite a beautiful thing if you'd like to oh. share that if you'd like to share uh, this is a very early map now, I've got actually quite a few maps from the, my old days in the sort of late 70s and early 80s playing these games. This one, um, I don't, you know, it didn't really last long. I obviously made it up. I've got Axe Land and Flail Land and Sword Land. And the imaginatively named Arrow Land. Arrow Land, um, Shield Land. But notice, I've got, you know, there's, there's uh, an awareness of languages here because they've all got names. And they're the translations. So there's actually Laril, which is Flail Land, and Kala, Kalapatra, which is Sword Land, and Arangnia, which is Axe Land. I don't think I actually used this, this place in any games, but obviously it was an early attempt at, at um, doing a place. And I was obviously influenced by Empire of the Petal Throne because these, games, these names are very long and difficult to pronounce. I quite like Sunspike Sea, though. Nice bit of alliteration, I reckon. I'm quite interested in this because, of course, you did do the design for Tales of the Arabian Nights, which yes. featured a map. Did you hand draw that? Oh. Uh, no, no. This one is Blackmoor. Blackmoor is a very, very famous early campaign that Dave Arneson, who was one of the original creators of Dungeons & Dragons, along with Gary Gygax, his campaign was set in Blackmoor, and that was like the really early days of D&D. So... This includes the city-state of the Invincible Overlord, and there was a Judges Guild module set in the city-state of the Invincible Overlord. And, um, yeah, I obviously copied that out at some point because I was going to use it, but I don't think I ever did do any adventuring in Blackmore. They're interesting, aren't they? Yeah, this is... I'm wondering what the dungeon-level geomorphs are. Geomorphs, yeah. yeah. Um, this is another very early pack, and look at this. When you bought things... Typewritten typesetting. So again, back to the old typewriter. This was actually typed on a sheet and then printed as a product. And this was uh, the Dungeon Geomorphs, things like this. And this is really early stuff. I mean, I've actually cut it up because this is what you're supposed to do. There are squares of um, dungeon corridors and then you can arrange them in any pattern you want to come up with dungeons. Because one of the first things we ever did when we started playing D&D is um, making dungeons on graph paper. Mm. So that was, yeah, the thing was you got a piece of graph paper and you made up a dungeon and you went down and the emphasis was definitely on dungeons back then. Now this uh, clearly looks like a piece of paper taken from like a school exercise. Oh, I guess a school exercise, exercise book. As yes. we call them in Australia at least. Yeah. Oh, this is when I was starting to develop my own country in a little bit more detail, Finnair. I remember Greater Finner and Finner and Yarf. These were all the doors. And I've got the capital and population resources. 
you know, talk about, you know, as a 12 year old doing mm. this kind of stuff, working out the population of countries and their main resources and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty full on. So these are the countries in this place. There's Finnair and Greater Finnair, Yarif, Nethashadad, Lana, Skygorm. I thought that was That's pretty good. Skygorm. Nice. Skygorm. Don Kreb T. Bang the camera there. Yes. Uh, Northern Idivad, Arthra, the forest of Rumegan, and the Dark Kingdom. <laughs> There's always a Dark Kingdom. Yeah, I quite like that Skygorm. So I need to ask, yeah. was Dungeons and Dragons really your first game or were there other role playing games before that? So no, the first Empire one, of the Petal Throne. The first one was Empire of the Petal Throne, which is, was the second game that TSR came out with after Dungeons and Dragons. Hmm. Um, and it was a very similar system to Dungeons and Dragons, except it was created by Professor M. A. R. Barker, who was a linguistics professor, and he created his own world called Tecamel. And in fact, I did the website for Tecamel.com, um, which because it's still going strong. He's unfortunately passed away now, but he created an amazing world, and uh, that's the first game we played. But we played a very, very, very simplified version of that before we swapped over to D and D. Um, that's kind of interesting because it's mentioned in the back of, oh, yeah, of the back of this. This is the book. Um, so yeah, this is the really early stuff that TSR was selling. So where is it? Oh yeah, Empire of the Petal Throne, fantasy adventure on the world of Tecamel. Three full color maps, boxed twenty seven fifty. That was a lot of money, and I could not afford it. My friend Andrew had it, mm -hmm. and he he. I was just amazed that he could afford $27.50 because that was a lot of money when I was 12 and I couldn't buy it. This is US though, of course, so it's more expensive than Australia. Um, but it was still like 35 bucks or something crazy. So um, I only got a copy like 20 years ago and I finally got a mint copy on eBay. So you're well known for your game rules summary sheets. What did you learn from Dungeons and Dragons all of those years ago that you've taken into? Game summary. Sheet. Game summary sheet. In. Sheeting. Is that a, it's a verb? Sheeting. Sheeting. <laughs> oh, that's Excellent. a different word. Yes. <laughs> Game rule summary. Sheeting. Sheeting. You've got to be careful. You're you a that. good sheeter. <laughs> um, what have I learned? I don't know. The main thing I learned is that I always look back on is that Dungeons and Dragons made me want to be a graphic designer. I think it started with Dungeons and Dragons because I didn't want to be a player. I always wanted to be the referee. <laughs> I'm pleased about that. <laughs> I love I'm not a player. Yeah, I never said I was a player. Because <laughs> I was at one point. Anyway. Um, but I didn't want to, I wanted to be the referee and I wanted to create the worlds, as you can see with these things, these maps and all this stuff. I wanted to create all that stuff, I wanted to draw the dungeons, and I wanted to make character sheets like this typewritten one. Where is it? We haven't even shown that yet. That's the original stuff. So what I'm doing here is this is says island guidelines. And it's a whole lot of stuff, random tables, about um, what you can find on an island for some reason. So coastal encounters, island approaches, seabed inhabitants, shore party, all this kind of stuff. I think I copied this from a Judges Guild module or something like that to use in my own games. Are you sure you didn't get your mum to type it though? Because that's... It's pretty good, isn't it's it? It's very beautiful. It's actually laid got out. columns and all Yes, it's got it. columns and underlines. You know, that's a very good question. We should interview your mum next. We should. <laughs> She'll go, Dungeons and Dragons. No, I, you know, I don't know, but look, there's, there's a lot of tipex as oh, well. there's a lot of tipex. This what? is liquid paper. Liquid paper, it was called. You know, if you made a mistake, you got this white liquid. People don't know this. And they actually, they you actually painted it out, you know, if they're younger than us, painted it out and then typed over the top. It was incredibly laborious. But um, knowing how picky... in school as well. He's in school. school work. Knowing how um, you know meticulous I was, even at that age, I, you know I could have done this. And your mum could probably type better than that. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So um, this is the machine that this was typed on. You some should turn handy... the machine around and put the because we can only yes, see right. it. Yeah, it's in Libya. It's made in West Germany. Yeah. So um, that would have been typed in um, probably about 1978. So what's that? That's to 22, it's like 42 years ago. Oh my lord. And it is the first thing that you mentioned when you saw that typewriter. It is. I knew said... I had something in there. And there it is. Oh, okay, so final words about 
Dungeons and Dragons. I, what's it been like talking about Dungeons and Dragons? Oh, it's fun. It's really nice. And it's amazing how all this stuff is, I have a pretty bad memory and yet it's still quite vivid and in my imagination. And the other amazing thing is, is that Dungeons and Dragons is still going incredibly strong. There's a whole new generation of people playing it. Um, there's a whole lot of sort of, you know, groovy young people playing it, which they weren't playing back then. We were not groovy at all. Um, we were more like the kids in Stranger Things. And um, it's, it's really good to see it going much more mainstream and people enjoying it. And any form of role playing it doesn't have to be Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, there are, there are thousands of different types. It's a fantastic hobby. So on that note, would you like to maybe undo a button of your shirt and show us that logo with your pride? It's Derek Order of Gamers. You know where it is, orderofgamers.com. Thanks, babe. Thank you. Yeah, this is fun. We might do it again sometime if you like it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs>